I'll go ahead and get started um, with us. I'm the chiropractor here, so I'm going to take more of a biomechanical, um, you know, functional approach to it. So this is just the outline for what we're going to be talking about today. So what it, we'll, we'll first start off with what exactly is arthritis. So when you break down the word arthritis, you can break it into two parts. Arthro means joint, and in, itis means inflammation. So basically arthritis is a pretty general term that means joint inflammation. So there are over 100 different types of conditions and pathologies that affect our joints and actually cause inflammation of the joints. So we'll talk about the, a few of the most common ones, but just to, to let you know, arthritis is a pretty general term. So some of the things that we feel with arthritis pain, stiffness, redness, swelling. Um, you might have joint deformity if it's in its later stages, as well as decreased range of motion. So the most common types of arthritis, I've highlighted the two most common types that we'll really be talking about today. But the first one is called osteoarthritis. This is more commonly known as degenerative joint disease. So this is what we typically think of when we think of arthritis. This is that wear and tear on our joints, you know, the wearing down of the cartilage, the wearing down of the joints, and the pain that we feel. And this typically occurs, you know, when we're later in life. Um, the second common, time, common type is rheumatoid arthritis, and um, this is also commonly known as inflammatory arthritis. And this is where the body's own immune system actually attacks the fluid in the synovial membranes that surround each of our joints. So it's actually the body attacking itself. So when this occurs, it typically occurs all over the body, and it occurs on both sides at the same time. So I've listed a few of, the, again, some of the more common types of conditions that do affect the joints, but we're not going to be going into detail on these. So this is a representation of what a normal joint looks like, and then again, the two most common types of arthritis. So what I want you to notice with, let's see, I have a pointer here. So with the joint, you have, you know, two bones that come together and articulate. But what's covering each of the bones is you have a layer of cartilage cells. And then also around the cartilage cells, you also have this sac of what's known as synovial membrane filled with synovial fluid. This is kind of like the lubrication. This is the WD-40 that surrounds our joints. This is what allows them to move smoothly and allows you know, our joints to glide on one another without feeling any pain. Because the cartilage that surrounds our joints don't have any what are known as nociceptors or pain receptors. So as long as the cartilage is, is, is gliding correctly, we don't feel any pain. The other real interesting thing about the anatomy of a joint is it's what's known as an avascular structure, meaning there are no blood vessels that actually go into our joint spaces. There are blood vessels in the bones and there are blood vessels in all of the tissues that surround our joints, but the cartilage and that synovial fluid of our joints don't actually have direct blood flow to them. So the way that they receive their nutrition is by a process of diffusion. So all of the nutrients, all of the oxygen has to diffuse in, and then all of the waste has to diffuse out. And so does anybody know the best way to facilitate the process of diffusion? Movement. So movement, movement of the joint facilitates the process of diffusion of nutrients and oxygen in and waste out. So when we start talking about osteoarthritis, this is where the joints, for whatever reason, are biomechanically not working correctly. And over, you know, they might be slightly misaligned or you might have had a traumatic injury, but over time these joints aren't moving correctly, so you don't have the correct, you know, flow of nutrients in and, and waste out. So that's depicted... That's depicted here for you. You can see at, over time the cartilage starts to wear and then you actually have articulation of bone on bone. And the bone actually does have pain receptors in it. So when you get to that point where there's bone on bone, you do start feeling pain. Um, this is rheumatoid arthritis. And this you can see, this is the synovial membrane that surrounds our joints. And so the immune system starts attacking this membrane and, and so that's where you start to get the inflammation, which Dr. Ron will be talking about more here in just a second, but you get an influx of inflammation into the joints and that's where they, they start swelling, they get red, they get hot, they get inflamed and like I said, rheumatoid affects multiple joints at the same time. Uh, one other thing that's not depicted here that I want to mention quickly too is that our joints 
feed information to our brain. So our brain is in constant communication with all of the joints in our body. So we have what are known as mechanoreceptors that sense the amount of pressure on each of the joints. And then you also have stretch receptors in all of the muscles and all of the ligaments that surround the joints. So you can imagine if you have any sort of misalignments or any sort of biomechanical errors in your joints, you're gonna be feeding you know, the wrong information to the brain. And so the brain might inhibit or might contract the wrong muscles, you know, over a period of time. This can lead to, again, it contribute to the degenerative process. So I'm um, specifically focusing on osteoarthritis because this is really, you know, a biomechanical error in the joints that leads to the inflammation. There are a couple of different reasons why people develop osteoarthritis or degenerative arthritis. You could have a traumatic injury and that requires surgical repair and surgically repairing the joint can lead to again biomechanical errors and that can predispose you for future injury down the road. Um, you could have multiple minor injuries. So this you can think of the football player who's getting, you know, hit and pounded, you know, game after game after game to where there's not a traumatic injury, but again, multiple minor injuries to where you have repetitive trauma. And then where most of us fall into this, which this to me is almost the most insidious type of um, damage to our joints, is the daily wear and tear on our joints. If we think about all the things that we do on a daily basis that we don't think about, like for us as women, wearing our purse on the same side every single day and not switching back and forth, or wearing improper shoes, or gaining weight, not even necessarily you can, gaining a lot of weight in a short amount of time, but then also gaining weight, you know, a lot of weight over a long period of time can cause damage to our joints and again disrupt the biomechanical movement of our joints. Um, there was a study that was done that found that by, for every pound that you lose, there is a fourfold decrease in the amount of force that's exerted on your knees. So, so you can imagine then over the course of even 10 to 20 years, you know, 20 pounds of weight on your body is an additional 80 pounds of pressure that's put on your knee joints. So again, this repetitive wear and tear trauma over a long period of time can lead to, you know, the damaging effects. Um, so what can we do to improve biomechanics? What are some of the best things? Well, exercise. Exercise is universally one of the best things you can do. Even if you are already in a stage of degeneration, exercise is great. And that goes back to that fact that we have that avascular, that avascular structure of the joints. So by movement, and again, focusing on low impact types of movements, but movement of the joints is going to feed nutrition and oxygen into those joints and help repair and heal them. Um, so, you know, non-weight bearing like water aerobics, swimming, biking, and then weight loss, simple weight loss. Exercise is great for weight loss, and again, like we just talked about, that's great for um, relieving the force off your joints. Um, improved posture. So posture is, again, another daily wear and tear on our joints that the, all of those receptors that I talked about that feed information to our brain, if we have an improper posture, they are feeding aberrant information to our brain. And so, again, short term, it's not going to have a huge effect, but you multiply that over 20 or 30 years and you're feeding that, that wrong information to the brain, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse, which is why a little bit of a, you know, curled sh shoulders and forward head posture turns out to be this in old age. So a little bit, you know, over multiplied over many years can make, you know, a big impact. Um, regular chiropractic care. You know, chiropractic care is one of the best ways to realign and have proper biomechanical movement of your joints. So that not only are you having correct movement, but then again, correct feedback information to the brain. Um, and then rehabilitate injuries. So if you do have surgery or you do have a traumatic injury, um, going through the rehabilitation process helps retrain your body, again, back to the correct movement patterns. And so it's extremely important to follow through on a care plan with something along those lines. I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> so I've included this. This is just something fun for you guys, talking about posture. A lot of us have desk jobs, so and the people are asking me constantly, what is the correct posture to be in? So I've included this um, so that you have a general guide of what we should be looking like when we're at work or driving in our car, um, the correct posture to be in.
All right, I'm going to pass the mic over. Um, Dr. Huninghockey is going to be talking to us about inflammation and how inflammation affects our joints. <clears throat> well, thank you, Anne. Um, I don't know if you know this, but Anne, Anne is our number two daughter. Of course, she's number one in my heart, but... Uh, and she's always telling me, Dad, stand up and sit up straight, so I guess I better listen to my kids. So uh, we're very happy to have her here and working with us. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about inflammation per se. And inflammation, unfortunately, has gotten this bad name that somehow inflammation itself is bad. And it's not. We, we wouldn't, as a species, have survived if we didn't have a strong inflammatory system. But things have changed in the world around us. And these changes have brought about a situation to where we're more prone to inflammatory conditions. And so uh, I have promised Anne that I'm going to get this all done in about 10 minutes, and she doesn't believe me, but I'm going to try. And so for what I can't tell all of this story about, I, I would encourage you to get my little book that she helped me write about five years ago, Inflammation, Arthritis, and Aging, which is just a short little primer on this concept that inflammation itself is not bad, but the way our body regulates inflammation has gotten out of whack, and now we have all kinds of chronic inflammatory conditions like arthritis that are afflicting us very much in our modern day and age. We have a number of degenerative conditions, and I challenge you to think of one medical condition that doesn't have some kind of itis or inflammation in it. So inflammation is a, it's, it's pain, it's swelling, it's redness. There are little messengers that are released that uh, tell the white blood cells where to go, where to start the healing process. Uh, thank God we have this and, and, and uh, things heal, or at least they're supposed to because we live in a world of hard knocks and we need to have a strong healing process. But unfortunately, um, this bad inflammation has found its way in. It's a systemic type of inflammation that you can actually find out whether or not you have it by getting a C-reactive protein done. Anyone in here had a C-reactive protein? Do you know what I mean by that? It's a blood test that you can get from your doctor. It can tell you whether or not you've got a little bit too much of the bad inflammation going on. So <clears throat> we really need to understand the difference between regulators versus triggers. So the common triggers that bring about uh, arthritis is wear and tear, physical injuries, bad posture, infection. There's a lot of people that believe that osteoarthritis may be a chronic kind of infection or an autoimmune disease. Certainly some of the rheumatoid arthritis is, are autoimmune diseases. Environmental stressors, toxins, allergies, food sensitivities. We do a food sensitivity test here that can be amazing at helping you determine which foods like for example, the nightshades are known to be a classification of foods that can trigger uh, arthritis, dietary imbalances and deficiencies. And Dr. Dr. Kohlmeier is going to talk a little bit about that. But these triggers do not cause unhealthy inflammation. And, and for a lot of people, this is, this is like a little mind thing. What, what do you mean? Because if that were true, because these are things that we're all exposed to, but not everyone gets arthritis. Why not? <clears throat> so what we have to think in terms of is that the body is a balancing act. Health is homeostasis. It's balance. And if you lose your balance between the good inflammation and the bad inflammation, that's where things start to become unhealthy. So let's use an analogy. This is a little hard, hard concept to understand until you use a simple analogy. Let's think of sunshine as being pro-inflammatory and rainfall as being anti-inflammatory and then if you have a nice ratio one-to-one -one ratio of sunshine to rainfall in a, in your in your lawn in your in your field <clears throat> you're going to have a healthy field of grass right it's going to be nice and green and but if you if you had too much sunshine like like drought like what we've got going on now in this era uh, and not enough rainfall, then you're going to be predisposed to fire. 
So thinking about that, if, if, if the match is the trigger that causes the field of grass to catch on fire, if there's a one-to-one -one ratio of sunshine to rainfall and the grass is nice and green, you can throw as many matches into that field as you want and it will not catch fire. The trigger does not cause the inflammation. It's the, it's the healthy balance of the field being out of whack that sets the stage for the uh, field to catch on fire when you throw the match in. So what that field is, it's dysregulated. And so we're finding out that most of the modern e diseases are where we've lost the balance in the healthy regulation of our body. So this is where unhealthy inflammation is caused by an excess of pro-inflammatory regulators. So why does that happen? So that, that happens mostly because of what's happened to our diets. And so I'm going to show you how historically things have changed a lot in uh, the way we eat. It doesn't seem like it because we just, most of us have grown up eating the way that we eat. But there are clues that tell us that we need to make some better choices. And really, a lot of people are catching on to this already. So the four areas or epochs of diet that I'm going to talk about is our ancestral diet. I don't know how far you want to take that back. Our agricultural revolution, that, how that changed us. The industrial revolution made further changes in the way we eat. And now we're living in the age of convenience and fast foods and what that's done to us. And so this is where I'm going to kind of skip over these slides. Dr. Eaton went into this in quite a bit of detail. Uh, and I'm, it's in my book in quite a bit of uh, detail that I won't go into. But it's just basically that our ancestors were hunter-gatherers. They ate uh, a, quite a bit of animal protein as well as a huge variety of plant matter from leaves, roots, fruits, berries, seeds, and nuts. So he showed that the primitive hunter-gatherers were much healthier than what we are, even though they didn't live as long. They, they were healthier, uh, but they rarely experienced inflammatory disease. The composition of their diet was fairly high in protein, fairly high in fat. So this kind of, we're, we have to get away from this idea that fat is the cause of, of, of disease. Uh, certainly there are bad fats, and I'm not recommending trans fats, but a natural, like for example, farm diet or a very primitive diet is naturally high in fat. But the types of carbohydrates that a primitive diet have, has is completely different than what we're uh, typically going to eat. And you've got these lists in your, in your handouts. I'm not going to go through them. But in, in general, the whole foods tend to be higher in antioxidants. What we see in the ancestral diet is 100% whole foods. We see very low glycemic index, mostly lean meats and fish. We see a very high favorable ratio between the omega-6 to 3. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And we see large amounts of these high ORAC. ORAC means the, uh, the high antioxidant foods, the, the foods that are rich in colors like blueberries and red beans and, and uh, colorful fruits and vegetables. So these turn out to be a kind of index that we can look at to determine whether or not we're eating a, a low-risk diet in terms of inflammation. If it's, if it's got a high percentage of wholeness, a very low glycemic index, a one-to-one -one ratio of omega-6 to 3, and then the ORAC score, which, the, which is oxidative reactive uh, score. <clears throat> so looking back at our at our ancestral diet, like I said, 100% whole, one to one, six to three, very low glycemic and very high in these antioxidants, all these fruits and berries and roots and whatnot, colorful roots. So let's compare that uh, to the agricultural diet where it became a little bit less diverse. There was a, a marked increase in grains which are richer in omega-6. The domesticated meats were fed grains. So we have a pro-inflammatory shift from omega-3 to omega-6. There's less vegetable matter than what our, our uh, hunter-gatherers ate. And the, the Egyptian uh, people were the first agricultural society. But when we look at the mummies, they were not very healthy. That, that's where we saw obesity beginning. That's where we saw dental cavities and caries and osteoporosis beginning. So this shift was not necessarily a healthy shift. And even though it wasn't as dramatic as modern times, 
they still were beginning to show the, the changes of uh, more inflammation, the inflammatory system beginning to be out of balance. And so you can, you can look at and compare, and now the agricultural diet has 90 percent wholeness, 5 to 1, 6 to 3 ratio, a medium glycemic index because we have more uh, refined grains starting to show up, more grains. And then the ORAC score, there was less of these colorful vegetables. So why is this 6 to 3 ratio important? Because these cytokines are what turn the inflammatory system on. And when they're out of balance, when they're dysregulated, they turn on the inflammatory system in an inappropriate way. So these cytokines regulate inflammation. The fatty acid ratios regulate the cytokines. The dietary choices regulate the fatty acid ratios. And unfortunately, most of us have grown up with habits and tastes for things that are not necessarily good ratios. And so you have to use your knowledge to begin to overcome habit and taste. So the ancestral diet, as I said, was one-to-one, -one, and the pro-inflammatory effect was balanced by the anti-inflammatory effect. But unfortunately, when you start shifting that to a five-to-one ratio, you're already beginning to shift it in the direction of more inflammation. And so I think uh, Jennifer's going to go into this in a little bit more detail, but the arachidonic acids are what's in the omega-6 oils, like margarines and vegetable f oils. They're omega-6. And, and the, the, uh, the, f the meats that are being fed corn and, and a lot of grains, unfortunately, they have a higher amount of fatty acids, whereas the grass-fed meats tend to have more omega-3. So these are the enzymes that get triggered inappropriately by the omega-6s, and they turn on the inflammatory system. And this is why most of your medications are anti-COX and anti-LOX type uh, uh, pharmaceutical agents, <clears throat> which I won't go into a lot of detail. So I'm going to skip this. So this is where we're talking about when we lose that ratio, the, inf the field becomes more drought-ridden, more dried out, and it it's easier for the trigger to start the inflammatory process. Now, let's shift to one more level up in terms of history, and that is where we, we went to the Industrial Revolution. And this is the beginning of extensive food processing, where you can, you can introduce margarines and separated fats, you can refine the grains down to white flour, you can introduce cheap white sugar. It's what I call the white plague started to take place. And you have the displacement of nutrient-dense whole foods with these nutrient-poor refined foods. And all of this led to increased shifts in the direction of pro-inflammatory. And you can see these percentages changing now. The percent wholeness is only about 65 percent. The omega-6 to 3 ratio has gone up to 10 to 1 because of all the refined grains that are being used in foods now. The glycemic index is, is high, all the white sugar, the white flour. And the ORAC score, we're, 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 we're processing out all those wonderful, colorful phytonutrients. Our, the modern diet's becoming blander and whiter and, you know, just less, less nutrient dense. So you can tell these are the high glycemic foods, table sugar, white flour, white potatoes, juices, uh, soda pop, these kinds of things. They rapidly enter the bloodstream. They strain the pancreas to produce, overproduce insulin. And over time, insulin resistance develops. And so the low glycemic foods are the ones that you want, vegetables, whole foods. They're slow entry into the bloodstream. They keep your blood sugars level, and you're less likely to get diabetes. So you avoid that roller coaster ride. People that get up in the morning, have their cup of coffee and a donut, then they have a Dr. Pepper for breakfast, or, or they have a Coke and, a, and uh, cookies and, and white you know, flour uh, sandwiches and stuff for lunch. And, you know, you just think about what our typical fast food diet's about, and that activates a lot of insulin, which tends to convert the uh, insulin will convert the omega-6 to arachidonic acid, which once again triggers more inflammation. So, so sugar is a pro-inflammatory food. So then we get into the modern convenience diet and the fast food diet. The percent wholeness of food is less than 35 percent or something like that. It's just terrible. And the omega-6 to 3 ratio is 20 to 1. The glycemic index of convenience foods is very high. The ORAC score is very low. And so it's, is it any wonder that 
uh, people are suffering from arthritis in such high numbers these days. And it's part of our culture. We don't even see it. We don't realize how much the diet has changed because of widespread food processing and manipulation of foods, very high intake of soda pop. These people that are having the, 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 m these giant soda pop drinks, you know, and whatnot. All this is uh, contributing to uh, the shift towards a pro-inflammatory field. That field is becoming very drought ridden and so the body is uh, way out of balance. So the modern diet is 20 times more pro-inflammatory with substantially fewer anti-inflammatory vitamins, minerals, and phytonutrients. So when you compare the pro-inflammatory foods that people are eating next to the anti-inflammatory, you can see that you have to make conscious choices in modern times if you want to avoid this tendency towards inflammation. So I'm just going to finish up. I'm going to be about two minutes over. I'm not too bad, Ann, huh? Uh, 14 anti-inflammatory dietary principles. Eat a variety of fresh and whole foods. Eat more fish, especially the cold water varieties. Eat grass-fed lean meats and game meats. Eat a lot of colorful vegetables. Use spices. These are spices are condensed colorful vegetables, in a sense, and herbs to flavor your foods. Use olive oil as your primary cooking oil. It's an omega-9 that does not trigger inflammation. Identify and avoid food allergens. Avoid conventional uh, vegetable cooking oils, which are rich in omega-6. Avoid and, in, and limit or limit the intake of refined sugars, refined grains, dairy products, snack on nuts and seeds. When thirsty, drink water and when possible, eat organically raised foods. The one new thing that I want to add that's not in this presentation and it's not in the book is that uh, there's a new book out now called Wheat Belly. And what most people don't realize is that about 40 or 50 years ago, the food scientists wanted to help feed the world because we have such a, a big population now. They wanted to help the farmers create a higher yield per acre. And they were successful. We have these incredible yields now with the dwarf wheats and the stronger stalks and the bigger heads of, of grain. Unfortunately, they weren't looking at what happened to wheat as they changed the, the genetic uh, structure of wheat. And what we have now is that modern wheat has a higher glycemic index, even whole grain wheat, a higher glycemic index than sugar. And so people who are still consuming lots of wheat, even whole wheat, are actually on this roller coaster ride. And the proteins in wheat are very, uh, they're very morphologically similar to uh, endorphins. And so they have a kind of an addictive quality about them. And so until you start looking at the whole uh, wheat issue uh, in terms of as part of what I just presented to you, you may be struggling with your weight, you may be struggling with your blood sugar and with your arthritis. He, the, 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 the writer of the book, uh, wheat Belly has a whole chapter on arthritis and how wheat, whole wheat can contribute to arthritis. So with that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Jennifer Kallmeyer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ron. Yeah, go ahead. All right, is this working? Can you guys hear me? Thank you. All right, so I figured that I would Pretty spend good. my 10, 15 minutes talking to you guys about some naturopathic treatments for arthritis or more natural herbs and things that we use to treat arthritis and inflammation in general. And I think this is going to be a great way to follow up on your 14 diet principles that Dr. Ron talked about because a lot of this you can get in your diet, but the first most important thing is the diet because that's the foundation. You can take these supplements all day long and while they might help, you really want to have the foundation because that will help these supplements to help your arthritis and your pain better. So what I'm going to talk to you about is, actually it's five, I forgot to change that, but five natural products that, um, that I currently use to help people who have arthritis, okay? We're going to talk about their, mecha their mechanism of action so that you understand why it's being used, or you probably a lot of you guys are taking some of these, these compounds. And I'm also going to talk about other ailments that these herbs are good for as well and contraindications or when not to use these. Okay, so capsicum, I'm not going to try to pronounce that because I will butcher it, but that is the Latin word for cayenne. Cayenne is the, the, when you put cayenne pepper on your food, it's actually the fruit of the cayenne that you are putting on your fruit. 
The active constituent is the carotenoid, which is um, similar to beta carotene. That's probably the most famous carotenoid that you guys have heard about. But it's actually the red color from the cayenne that has the medicinal effects. Again, the color, having a colorful diet in general is very good for arthritis. But the mechanism of actions, I listed those, anodyne, analgesic, that just means pain reliever. It helps with pain. It's a carminative. That means that it helps with digestion. It helps um, your body secrete digestive enzymes. Cayenne pepper does that. It's a diaphoretic. It helps you sweat. How many people have had cayenne and you start sweating? It's, it, and that is really good in certain instances. It is a rubefacient. That just means it will really turn your skin red, and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, it increases digestive enzymes. It helps with circulation. It dilates your blood vessels. It will break up platelets, and it's a bronchodilator, so it'll help open up your, your lungs. So those are all the mechanisms of actions of cayenne pepper. And it is extremely high in vitamin C and vitamin A. It's actually one of cayenne and chili peppers in general have the highest amount of vitamin C, much, much, much higher than oranges. So most people don't know that. So what cayenne pepper does is it decreases substance P. And so what that is, is just a neurotransmitter that causes, um, that causes your pain nerves to signal your brain, okay? So it's used topically. So you might have seen cayenne um, lotion before, and it, will, it does a really good job of helping local pain. So in the area, it's great for arthritis. You can rub it on your knees. You can rub it on your feet if you're having pain in your toes, and it will decrease pain. It all, that substance P, so it'll decrease pain. It also, you, it feels really hot, and because heat gets to the brain much quicker than pain, you will feel heat for a while instead of the pain signal. So it's a temporary pain reliever. And it's best used topically for things like arthritis. It also is used a lot, you can use it orally for arthritis. It also dilates blood vessels, so it'll help with um, bringing nutrition into the joint. And if you bring nutrition and blood into the joint, that can help with healing, okay? So it's especially good for um, the periphery, so arthritis in the feet, hands, elbows, knees, more than the back. It is also used to help with cold hands and feet, so people that have Raynaud's syndrome, if you've ever heard that term before, Raynaud's, really, really good for that. It's good for clotting disorders. It's good for people that have a history of DVTs or deep vein thrombosis in their calves to keep that on there, to rub it on their calves. It's good for that as well. We use it for sore throats, okay? It helps with the pain of a sore throat, decongestion, gas and bloating. It prevents stomach ulcers. A lot of people think that hot peppers cause stomach ulcers. Not true. It will help prevent because it'll kill a lot of the bacteria that cause stomach ulcers. So cayenne and chili peppers in general are fantastic for preventing stomach ulcers, boost immunities. It is an antihistamine. It helps with weight loss and it lowers blood lipids. So there's a lot of great benefits for um, cayenne pepper. You don't wanna use it before surgery, over broken skin, it'll burn like the Dickens, and you don't wanna use it if you have a stomach ulcer. And I say caution with neuropathy, it's great for diabetic neuropathy and things like that, but you wanna be cautious because it can decrease sensation in the area and cause injury if you don't feel your feet very well. And you wanna use caution when you're on anticoagulants like Coumadin and things like that, okay? The next one is curcuma longa. The common name is turmeric. And the active constituent is curcumin. A lot of times I get the questions, what's the difference between turmeric and curcumin? Curcumin is just a part of turmeric, okay? Turmeric's that spice. It's in a lot of Indian food. So it's an anti-inflammatory, it's anti-neoplastic, which means it's great for cancer. There's a lot of good research with turmeric and cancer. It's an antioxidant, it's a bitter. Bitter stimulates digestion, so it's fantastic for people who have digestive problems. Hypolipidemic just means it lowers blood lipids, it helps um, break up platelets, and it's very, very good for the liver. So I use it a lot with peop when people who have hepatitis and liver diseases like that. So turmeric is definitely, it's not used topically, it's used orally. So normally you can use it in your cooking or you can take it in capsules. 
I think I went over. It's best, turmeric is best more for inflammatory type arthritis, like Dr. Ann talked about rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis. Um, there's a lot of other inflammatory arthritis. Not quite as good for osteoarthritis or the wear and the tear joint arthritis. You can use it for allergies, chronic sinusitis, constipation, it's fantastic for high lipids. Like I said, hepatitis, it's great for eczema and other inflammatory skin disorders. And lack of menstruation in women. I've used it a lot for that. So when not to use it before surgery, any type of bile duct obstruction, because it can really, it stimulates bile production. So if you have a sluggish gallbladder and you're not producing a lot of bile, it'll help with bile production, but you don't wanna use it if you have an obstruction. You don't wanna use it in pregnancy. And hypothetic, well, it's, it's known as a, what we call an immunagogue. <laughs> and what that means is it increases blood to the uterus area. And hypothetically, it could stimulate an abortion if you use it in high doses in pregnancy. So I would never use turmeric in pregnancy. Um, I always say you can eat turmeric in foods, just don't supplement it when you're pregnant. And gradually, you want to increase the dose because it can cause some GI distress, a lot of gas and bloating and stuff. So don't start high doses very quick. Just gradually taper your dose up with turmeric. Salix is the next one. That's the white willow tree. There's a picture of it. The part used is the bark. How they figured this out way back when, I have no idea, but they found a, something in the bark that was beneficial. It's, it's a pain reliever, anti-inflammatory. It's really, really helpful for arthritis pain, joint pains, headaches, muscle pains. It's historically was used more for fevers and infections. But what Salix is, um, it, you absorb it through the GI tract, and then when it goes to the liver, that's when the active ingredient is formed in the liver, to salicylic acid. And then what that does is it basically inhibits those COX enzymes that Dr. Ron talked about earlier. All your drugs, your NSAIDs, your aspirins, your um, ibuprofens, they're all COX inhibitors. And that's, this is what Salix does, it's a COX inhibitor. And we actually get the common drug, does anyone know what comes from Salix, where we get the common drug? Comes from this tree? Does anyone know? Good job, and I saw some people whispering. Ask, Aspirin. That's actually where we get aspirin from, the white willow tree. What, they, what the chemists did is they added acetyl group to this salicylic acid, so it's acetyl salicylic acid. And supposedly aspirin is less um, hurtful to the GI tract because salix can really cause, cause ulcers, so it can cause ulcers. But the, sal the salicin from the white willow does not, it still says warning that it will thin blood, but it is not a blood thinner. It's, and it's, um, it's, not a ir it's not irreversible like aspirin is. So they think what white willow will thin the blood when necessary. So it keeps it at the proper viscosity. So you can't use white willow as a blood thinner. All right, so you don't use it when you have an aspirin allergy. Don't use it in children, just like you wouldn't use aspirin in children. You don't want to use it in GI ulcers and caution when you're taking Coumadin and other blood thinners. And it can cause high GI distress in high doses, just like aspirin can, okay? Boswellia, that's the Boswellia tree. And the common name is frankincense. And I'm sure everyone's heard of frankincense. One of the guests that's three wise men brought, right? Um, it's, it comes from the bark of that tree. And I put another picture about, this is a guy getting the um, frankincense from the tree. I thought that was kind of interesting. It's an anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial, so it helps with infections. So we use it a lot for bacterial infections. It's anti-neoplastic, meaning anti-cancer. So it's shown to help kill cancer cells as well. And actually, frankincense, that's where, that's the incense you burn. That's where they get the term incense from, if anyone didn't know that. All right, so what this does is, it decreases all those, in, um, those inflammatory cytokines Dr. Ron talked about earlier. Those little um, leukotrienes, what did you say? Cytokines? Cytokines is what uh, Boswellia does. So it's an inhibitor of that LOX, the L-O-X that he talked about. That's what Boswellia does. Okay, and then I'm, I'm running out of time. See, I'm taking longer than Dr. Ron did. <laughs> Sorry. 
So Dr. Ron talked about the omega-3 fatty acids and how our diets are way higher in omega-6. Omega-6 is good because you need inflammation. You need to be able to clot if you get in a car accident, but you don't want too much inflammation. You want to balance it out. So this is, I know this is kind of confusing, but I thought it was a little, a good diagra diagram. But if you see down at the bottom where it says cyclooxygenase and lipooxygenase, that's the Cox and Lox, right, that we talked about. And when arachidonic acid binds to Cox or Lox, if you look under, it makes the pro-inflammatory enzymes. When EPA, or the fish oils, bind to the Cox and Lox, it makes the anti-inflammatory. Um, cytokine. So, and if you look under there, there's other, it talks about other minerals that are needed, but basically if you increase your EPA, you're going to have a higher probability of those binding to Cox and Lox to make anti-inflammatory rather than arachidonic binding to make inflammatory. So you get a better balance by supplementing with fish oil or, you know, you can get rid of arachidonic acid or lower it and get fish oil this way. But that's basically what it's doing. It's promoting the anti-inflammatory pathway. Fish oil is not blocking anything like um, Boswellia was and those other ones. It's, it's um, promoting anti-inflammation, anti basically. So that's just a little diagram. And um, flax oil, fish oils, grass-fed meats, all those are higher in omega-3s. All right, and when you're picking a fish oil, I just want to make sure, be cautious. They're not all created equal. There's different um, concentrations. You want to always make sure it's molecularly distilled. It says it's somewhere on the bottle. And I just wrote a dosage about what you would take for arthritis. 1,500 milligrams of EPA about is what you'd want to take if you were on fish oil. Um, and be cautious because it can thin the blood too. Re so basically what we talked about, five natural treatments, cayenne, turmeric, white willow bark, frankincense and omega-3 fatty acids are all great for inflammation. And when I'm choosing treatments for patients, if you remember I talked about other ailments they're used for, I never see a patient just with arthritis. They always have something else going on. So I always kind of look at what herbs would kill more birds with one stone, and that's kind of how I choose treatment. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Henshaw, and he's going to give you a clinical laboratory perspective and talk about some labs. Well, good day. Uh, you would think that the laboratory would speak first because, not because we're the most important, but because that's what your doctor's going to order. But I do get the last word this way. <laughs> and one, one comment that just uh, struck me, when Dr. Ron was talking about the Egyptians and the onset of arthritis and many of our problems, that was also the time when white sugar w became known and available to the very wealthy classes. And the uh, Russia, the uh, Egyptian pharaohs and so forth had sugar, and it was a rare delicacy and very expensive. And that's when our problem started, too. Yeah. Um, I have listed, OK, a any kind of organized this for me right here. Uh, as you all know, one of the uh, major efforts in the uh, Reardon Clinic has been to uh, illustrate and develop uses for vitamin C. Some of the work on arthritis has recently been published by Dr. Mikarova, and she's our director of research. And she studied the effect of high dose intravenous vitamin C on patients with rheumatoid arthritis. The dosage was uh, 5 to 50 grams. I see here it says seven and a half, but I thought it was five. But at any rate, that, that's about the level where you can't uh, exceed it taking it orally. And if you do, you're going to have diarrhea. But if you give it intravenously, you don't have any of those problems. So this really is about the intravenous use of vitamin C. She measured uh, the inflammatory component of the arthritis patients using the this, this CRP high sensitivity test, uh, which I think Dr. Ann started uh, talking about that first. But that is a very good general measure of inflammation. And with the doses of vitamin C that were used, the, the level of inflammation of the CRP was reduced by 44%. 
This then is proposed as an early study uh, suggesting that the use of intravenous vitamin C will be a good way to reduce the bad actors, the bad inflammation in people with rheumatoid arthritis. Now there are really several kinds of arthritis, a couple of which haven't been mentioned at all, but uh, do bear mentioning. Uh, one of those types is uh, inflammatory arthritis due to infection, uh, septic arthritis. I don't think that's on the, on the screen or the notes. But sometimes people do get uh, infections in joints. It will generally affect a single joint, and uh, it can be diagnosed and treated successfully uh, through laboratory testing to uh, find out the microorganism that's causing the arthritis. You can measure the degree of inflammation uh, by l observing the synovial fluid in the, under the microscope and uh, treat that type of arthritis. Uh, has anybody talked about gout? Well, gout, gouty arthritis, there's probably some people in our audience that have gout, I don't know, but it's a fairly common thing these days. Uh, is marked by high uric acid and the uric acid crystals are like little tiny needles and they get into your joint spaces sometimes and they hurt. And the classic art from the 1600s shows a man with a, a elevated foot kind of and a great big red large toe, first toe. And that is a classic site for gout to manifest, although it does occur in all the other joints too. Uh, but if you have a real sore big toe and it looks red, you better start thinking about gout. Then you can come see Dr. Ron and Dr. Ann and, <laughs> and Dr. Jennifer. Um, now, other causes of arthritis uh, have been mentioned, autoimmune disorders in particular. Rheumatoid arthritis is a good example of that. So is lupus, lupus erythematosus. These uh, inflammatory conditions do generally engage uh, all of the joints, as Dr. Well, they, everybody's mentioned, I think, Dr. Ann primarily. Uh, and a, another, uh, another theory for autoimmune disorder is that it may be due to viruses. This is unconfirmed, but. Uh, beginning to be studied a lot. And some of the thinking is that the so-called osteoarthritis is actually an, a form of autoimmune arthritis also caused by viruses. In terms of the uh, excessive use of joints, there's even some doubt about what the role that plays in <laughs> arthritis these days. A paper from Harvard showed uh, runner, runners, uh, older runners, and they didn't have any more uh, arthritis than people of similar weight and age who didn't run. So there is some, there's a lot of, of research going on, let's say in arthritis. Now for testing, everybody's kind of stolen some of my thunder today. <laughs> Uh, the C-reactive protein first, we've already spoken about that. The RA factor, that's rheumatoid arthritis factor. There's an LE, two LE tests really that are pretty good for lupus. Uh, food allergy has been mentioned. We do the cytotoxic food sensitivity test. A lot of attention has been played to the um, ratios and quantities of the omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. Um, some of the fatty acids are good and some are bad, basically. Nobody's talked about thyroid, but that's kind of my, uh, my spiel these days. Uh, we have about 40 million people in the United States. Uh, we had, say, 20 or 30 years ago, and that has increased by about 25%. And many people think it's due to the more widespread and longer term use of fluorides. Certainly we know that people who accumulate a lot of fluorides in their skeletal system develop crippling arthritis. 
um, a number of other tests that are of interest and and helpful include a number of the trace minerals uh, chromium is of interest because it tends to increase the production of cholesterol and uh, fatty acids in the liver and they can be associated with obesity and um, joint pain. Copper is a really helpful enzyme, uh, trace mineral. It uh, helps in collagen formation and has some anti-inflammatory properties and generally in a patient with uh, osteoarthritis, just wear and tear arthritis, you tend to find elevated levels of copper and lower levels of iron. The iron itself is of interest not because it's low but because it tends to deposit in regional lymph nodes and tissues around the joints. That may lower the actual serum level of the iron but it's thought to be an irritant. So. Uh, if you, you try not to supplement with iron in patients with arthritis. Manganese stimulates the production of this uh, mucopolysaccharide, which is a, a carbohydrate, but it's kind of the lubricant of the joint. So manganese is a good one to have. If your manganese is low, then your doctor would supplement with that. Now I've made a long list of other things that are sometimes important. Um, and I'm going to run through these quickly. Uh, folic acid and B12 are sometimes found to be low in patients with um, arthritis. Copper, I mentioned already. Know how some people with arthritis wear copper bracelets? Well, it's thought that the perspiration causes a little bit of the copper to be absorbed through the skin and that's carried then to the joints and hence uh, people wear copper bracelets and think there's some type of electromagnetic field or something that's doing magic but actually it's just the copper uh, reducing the inflammation in the joints. Uh, calcium and magnesium of course play a role. They're primarily engaged however in the uh, in um, osteoporosis, but you want to have good bones, so I've listed calcium and magnesium. Uh, cysteine, histidine, phenylalanine all help in the management of pain or perception. We've already talked about the fatty acids. Superoxide dismutase, it's an enzyme which has strong anti-inflammatory uh, properties. Uh, so basically what it comes down to is uh, if the doctor is suspicious about your n nutritional structure or state, he's probably going to order or she quite a few laboratory tests because these will not only help ferret out causes but also point to directions in which your symptoms and the condition itself can be relieved. I believe with that I would pass from this and there will be some time for questions while well, I still have the chance <laughs> I want to mention that we do have a large laboratory uh, it's almost like an event we have it twice a year it's called check your health the price reduction on laboratory panels is 45 percent and you can also save 25 percent on the supplements our upcoming Check Your Health event is March 25th through the 29th. I will say this, I've been studying uh, la laboratory prices, not just in our lab, but nationwide and making a comparison. And uh, I sympathize with the patients and insurance companies when they have to pay the laboratory costs. This uh, business of a 45% reduction in costs is really a good deal. So if you can get it, Go for it.